Mario is not here. He, he got sick. I took him to the free clinic this morning. Uh, so hopefully he'll be back here feeling better on Wednesday. Um, for you guys in the class, hearing? Right. Uh, so again, homework five is due on uh, the Sunday coming up on the 3rd. Project four is due in the following week on the 10th, also midnight. Um, next Monday in class, sorry, next Monday not in class uh, over Zoom, we'll have a guest speaker from uh, Single Store talk about their distributed database system. And again, it'll cover a lot of the core ideas we've been talking about this th uh, the entire semester. And then you realize, oh, Andy's not crazy and just make it up. Like, this is what how people really build systems. Um, and then as I posted on Piazza yesterday, please go vote. We'll do a speed run on the last day of class. We'll start off with the final ex review for the final exam. And then we'll just plow through as many systems you, as you guys want, want to learn about. Um, and again, instead of having a giant drop down of 900 different databases, because nobody would click that, just copy and paste URLs in, and that way I can sort by uh, on, on uniqueness, right? Just do a, a group by it. Okay? Again, there's a post in Piazza that takes you to the Google form, and then vote as many times as you want. I don't care. Uh, the, I think the number one vote as, as this morning was Redis. Um, it's an interesting system. All right, final exam will be Tuesday, December 12th. Somewhere, we'll announce it. It'll be 8.30 in the morning because it's early, and that sucks. We'll do, like, coffee, donuts, and cigarettes for everyone in the morning. And then uh, Jake Nash is teaching this class by himself in the fall. So if, if you want more databases, uh, I want to go even deeper into Bus Hub, uh, please sign up for, to be a TA. Okay? And we'll post on Piazza how to make that happen. All right? There's a lot here. Any questions? We're almost done for the end of the semester. Okay. All right. Let's get through it. So last class, we started off talking about distributed database systems. Again, it was a high-level introduction to the key concepts about how people think about and reason and desi design these database systems. And again, unfortunately, there's no distributed data system course at, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, eventually, maybe we'll teach it, but right now it's just Jignex and myself, so we can't do that. So this, uh, this last lecture and this week's lecture is really much all you'll be able to get out of distributed databases uh, in sort of low-level detail uh, at, at Carnegie Mellon. Um, but the, again, the idea is to sort of give you a, a a litany of different concepts and ideas and techniques, and then that way when you go out in the real, real world, you'll see these ideas come up, and then you can reason about what, how people describe their systems. So we started off talking about the different system architectures. We said shared everything is basically what Bus Hub is. It's, it's a you know, single node system where everyone can communicate. The, the processes or workers can communicate very quickly. And then shared disk and shared nothing are the two sort of major distributed, archi distributed Davis architectures where shared disk was there's a single repository or a shared... Uh, a, single storage device that all the, the worker nodes can read and write to. Um, and then shared nothing is where each worker node, each node in the system has some portion of, of, of the database. And you have to send messages and pass data between the nodes directly. Then we talked about how to do partitioning or sharding, simple range partitioning, hash partitioning, again, splitting the database up into disjoint subsets and distributing them across different, um, different nodes. And then we talked about how to do transaction coordination at a high level, like is there a centralized coordinator that's in charge of taking all the queries, figuring out what locks or what data they're going to touch, and communicating between the different nodes, or is it decentralized, meaning the nodes are free to decide on their own how they're going to commit and order transactions. All right? So today's class, we're going to focus on transaction processing. Wednesday's class will be about um, uh, analytical processing or, or decision support systems. And, and again, we've talked about this many times. I, I just want to bring up the distinction between the two workloads uh, today, again, because then that'll help us understand what are, what are the different design trade-offs or things we're going to care about in one sort of category of a system versus another. Right, you can think, think of it like something like Postgres is meant to be like a general purpose database system. It is a row store, and it, it can do transactions. Primarily, people use it for OTP, but there are some aspects of it that you, that, that you would see in an OLAP system, right? But there's certain things that Postgres does that you wouldn't want to use in like a Snowflake system because they're not worried about running transactions. So the two rough categories uh, can be sort of broken up between these, these uh, characteristics. So for OLTB workloads, these transactions are going to be short-lived, uh, and they're going to be a combination of read-write uh, queries. And short-lived means like less than 100 milliseconds. Even that's a long time. 50 milliseconds is considered the max you, you want to have for a transaction. Uh, anything longer than that is considered uh, a long, longer run transaction. And that number comes from, that 50 milliseconds is like the conventional wisdom 
uh, in like internet advertising, like when you go visit a website, so you don't have an ad blocker turned on. If you don't, please do that. Uh, when you go visit a website, there's an ad blocker turned on. Sorry, if you go visit a website, the 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 ad serving company has an auction that it sends out information to all the the, the people that want, want to potentially put out ads to do like a bid on it. And they say, here's the information about this person visiting the website. And you have to give back a response roughly in 50 milliseconds, right? So roughly that's, that's where this number comes from. It might be down to 30 milliseconds nowadays. If you're doing high frequency trading, those guys are freaks and they want things less than a millisecond. Um, but the workload basically still looks the same. It's a lot of small uh, gets and sets. Uh, and then these operations are also gonna be very repetitive. Again, think of like going through a website. You can only do a certain many things on a website. You know, you're not sitting at a raw terminal putting in a SQL query. So you're running application code that's going to be running the same queries over and over again. And there's certain optimizations you can do if you know you're going to be running the same queries over and over again. Then OLAP, again, we'll focus this, focus more on this workload on Wednesday. Uh, but these, these are your long running queries, typically read only, doing a lot of joins. And oftentimes, there'll be sort of one-off ad hoc queries. Because someone's sitting in a dashboard, clicking a bunch of buttons to form a query. They click go to, to generate the visualization. And you, it's maybe the first time that the database system has ever seen that query. And it may never see it, see it again. So that limits what, op, some, what sort of optimizations you can do. All right, so this is the setup that we, we sort of care about today. Right? We have some application server that wants to run, run a transaction that's going to touch data at these uh, three partitions. I'm not saying where it's shared, whether it's shared disk or shared nothing. For our purposes right now, it doesn't matter. So somehow we've elected this one uh, first partition here to be the primary node. So the begin request for the transaction goes to this node. And let's say there's no centralized coordinator and the, the application is allowed to send queries directly to the, uh, the various nodes. Um, and then when it comes time to commit, it goes to the primary node and says, hey, can I commit? And the primary no node is responsible for figuring out amongst the nodes that participate in the transaction whether this thing's allowed to commit. All right, so that, our focus really today is like, is this sort of safe commit uh, step and how to get everyone to agree that yes, this transaction is safe, safe to commit. And then if they all say yes, it's going to commit, that we, we commit it. Right? And the, 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 all the stuff we talked about before, like two phase locking or multi version control or OCC, all of that is still happening here. Right? There's still, that's still the, 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 the mechanism that's going to use to determine is this thing allowed to commit on each individual node? And then there's a higher level process above that that's trying to get everyone to agree that it's, it's now time to commit this transaction. So that's the big picture of what we're trying to do today. And so, again, even though my last example, I showed the application going directly to, to different partitions. Ignore that for now. But the, the big picture of what we're trying to achieve today is that, and, and as, you, as you would want in any distributed data system, is that you want to have a, multi, so you want to have a, a single logical view against a single database system even though underneath the covers, it's comprised by multiple physical servers or multiple physical resources. And so we haven't talked about how, again, we're going to get a uh, transaction or sort of nodes to agree that we commit a transaction. And then if we decide that it is going to commit, how do we make sure that it does commit? That everyone, and if there's a crash or there's a failure, that when the this, this system comes back up, that if we, set, we told the outside world that a transaction committed, we have to make that guarantee. Right, that's that's the, the D in, uh, in asset, the durability uh, guarantee. But again, if the whole thing goes down and come back up, then you know, that's one thing. But what happens if one node goes down, which will happen? Right? So how do we deal with that? Well, what happens if we send a message, commit a transaction, and then the, the, the message get, get disappears somehow? Because you know, someone tripped over the cable, uh, there's, a, there's a weird hiccup in, in the network or something, and then now our, our message to commit this transaction shows up late. What do we do? What, what does the node do in, the, in, that, in that setting? And then what happens if every node, uh, uh, sorry, what happens if the system, we, we don't want to wait for everyone to, to agree to commit, but we still want to commit in some cases, or we don't want to block everything in, in case of one node goes down. Right? So one very, very important assumption that we're going to make in today's discussion uh, is that we're going to assume that all the nodes in our distributed database system are going to be well behaved and under the same administrative domain. And what I mean by that is like these are nodes, like if you're the database system operator, these are nodes you control, that you own, or you're renting, or whatever, and it's running software that that, it, that it's expected to run as part of the database server. Right? So that just means that we're not in this like weird uh, this weird un, un, uh, untrusted world where 
there's some nodes in our distributed database that we don't control and we're renting or like, like that people are running altruistically or something, right? Like it, and it's not gonna be the case that we go commit a transaction and one node's gonna be nefarious and start trying to screw with us and say, no, 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 we're not gonna commit that. Or like if, if everyone agrees that it commits, this other node gonna, isn't gonna come back later on and say, hey, look, you know, I lied, I, we didn't commit that transaction and, and start trying to change the state of things, right? So that kind of tolerance or that, that property is called Byzantine fault tolerance, right? And that's what you get if you get a blockchain. Right? Blockchain basically is just a database, a distributed ledger, a distributed write ahead log. And in that world, because something like on Bitcoin, where it's a bunch of people running these peer to peer networks where you don't control, no one, you know, no, there's no single authority controlling all the different nodes, you need a BFT talent or a BFT protocol. We don't care about that shit, right? That's a bunch of overhead that we don't have to, we don't have to deal with. Um, and to be honest, if you want to run transactions at scale, you wouldn't want to use a blockchain anyway because they measure their, their latencies in like seconds, right? If, if you go to a website and make an order on Amazon and it takes like 20 seconds to commit that transaction, you're gonna, you're gonna give up, right? So nobody runs a real database system uh, doing transactions on a, on a blockchain, right? This is stupid. The real world doesn't work this way. We, we can ignore that entirely, okay? So now, that doesn't mean a node won't crash, disappear, come back, and try to say, hey guys, I missed, you know, what's going on? I missed, you know, I missed, what, missed all the updates. And then you gotta go ahead and update. But again, that's just, a, uh, you know, that's a hardware failure, and we will have mechanisms to deal with that, and we're still not worried about whether, you know, the, the node is nefarious or not, okay? So it makes our lives, our lives out easier, a lot easier if we're not, we don't worry about visiting fault tolerance. All right, so today's, uh, today's, uh, lecture is really me again attempting to try to condense a year's worth of material in distributed databases into like one or two lectures. So we can't cover everything into detail. We're to go through like these are the most important things that you that you, you need to be aware of that exists and the challenges you would face when you when you have a distributed database system. So we're going to first talk about um, uh, how to the what replication looks like in this environment. So for most people, like you know when they say, "Oh, my database can't scale." The very first step you actually should do is, is replication. You should probably be doing this anyway for high availability and durability, but you can actually offload some reads to, uh, to replicas, to, depending on, on your workload, to alleviate some of the load and start scaling things out. So even though most people don't need a some massive distributed database system like a spanner, uh, you're going to need replication almost always, right, if you care about your data. Then we'll talk about atomic commit protocols, two-phase commit, Paxos, wrapped, how to actually get everyone to agree. And again, I realize there's, there's a distributed systems course at CMU that does a better job and spends more time talking about these things, but we, we just want to describe it in the context of databases. Um, and then we'll talk about consistency issues in the context of the CAT theorem, or Pacelic, uh, which is the follow-up to it, again, in the context of databases. And if you have time, we'll finish up just talking about Spanner real quickly, just because it encapsulates a, a lot of the ideas we'll talk about today and I consider this a, a, a state-of-the-art system, right? even though Google put it out you know, over 10 years ago. Uh, it does a lot of very interesting things. And then you do this one thing that nobody else does, which, which is you can do if you're Google and have Google money. Anybody take a guess what that is and know what that is? If you're familiar with Spanner? What's one? Atomic clocks. clocks, yes, we'll get there in a second. Uh, so spoiler alert, Google basically puts satellite hookups, get, gets the time from satellites, from GPS satellites, and has atomic clocks in every data center. And that doesn't make things magically uh, always in sync, but it reduces the bounds you have to, uh, how much time you have to spend waiting for new transactions to show up. Again, we'll, we'll get there in a second. But they're still gonna do Paxos, they're still gonna do phase commit, they're still gonna do MVC, all this other stuff. Okay, so with replication, the idea is that we wanna replicate the database, either a portion of it or all of it, across multiple nodes. And we want to do this to increase availability and, in some cases, scalability. Not always, but in some cases, yes. And again, we want to do this whether it's partitioned or not. So partition would be if I split my database up into to, to disjoint sets, I still want to have multiple copies of those disjoint subsets. So again, if one node goes down, I can still uh, potentially serve, serve, the, serve queries. Or if it's not partitioned, which is most database systems, then I want to be able to use the replicas for, for, for offloading maybe read-only queries. Right, so the idea is, again, we want to make multiple copies of data so that if any node goes down, we can still potentially remain online. So there's a bunch of design decisions we have to decide, or put in our system if we, if we want to add replication. Uh, so what the sort of overall configuration of the, of the architecture is going to look like. 
how we're going to propagate the updates, when should we propagate the updates, and then uh, the method in which we propagate those updates. So at a high level, basically, there's two approaches to do replication. You have what is called primary replica and multi-primary. So primary replica is the most common one. Uh, sometimes you'll see this as, as leader follower. The older terms use master slave. Uh, we obviously don't say that anymore. The problem is like a lot of the literature that describes this, uh, this configuration is going to be a bit older. So you have to Google master slave. But usually the, the newer stuff will, will refer to as primary replica. And the idea here is that all our updates are going to go to a single node, uh, primary node in, 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 the, in the database, right? And it's going to be that primary's responsibility to then propagate those updates to any replicas, right? So again, leader, follower, prim primary replica. And in some cases, depending on the system, how, if, they ex if they expose this capability, you'll allow read-only transactions to, to run queries on those replicas, right? And you can do this because the... The, if everything's all transactional, meaning if I do, do a, a transactional update on the primary, then I propagate that transactional update to the, to the replica, and that update is atomic, then any read query will see a consistent view of the database uh, at, in, on, on the replica. Right? It may not be the most up-to-date version, depending on how we propagate the updates, but it'll be at least consistent. And, and of course, you, you can relax that and see, uh, you know, see partial updates if you want. All right? So then what happens is if the, in the event the primary goes down, we'll hold some kind of election process, which will, will be Paxos or something, uh, and we'll elect a, one of the replicas to become a new primary, and then now all the writes will go to that, to, that, to that new primary, right? And if the old primary ever comes back up, it'll get relegated to, the, uh, to be a replica. Again, we'll handle that in a second. All right, so this is the, the top one here is what most people are going uh, to do. Um, the, bottom, the bottom one, multi-primary, sometimes called multi-home, uh, this is where the, the, the replica, the, every object will be replicated in cross multiple nodes, and any transaction can update that object, like a record, a table, whatever, at any possible node. And then when you go to commit, now the replicas need to synchronize amongst each other because they're all considered leaders, or, or the primary. They need, to, they need to coordinate with each other to figure out, okay, like who's allowed to commit uh, you know, who has the most latest version and how to reconcile any changes, right? So this is, you know, two visualizations of this. So, right, so again, primary replica, we have a single primary, and then the two replicas. All the read and write queries will go to the primary, and then the writes will get propagated to the replicas. And this is typically just sending the write-ahead log um, that we talked about before. Because you're just sending the write-ahead log of all the changes that come out of the primary, and the replicas are more or less in recovery mode and as if they're reading like this, this never-ending file from disk, and they're replaying the, the write-ahead log to apply the changes. And again, the write-ahead log could be physiological or physical, like here's the deltas of the, the, or the diffs I'm making on single pages, or it could be the queries. If you send the queries, things get tricky, because now like, if there's things in the query like timestamps or random, then you got to make sure that the, the replicas execute the exact same, uh, you know, have the exact same values for those functions when they run. And there's, there's tricks uh, to handle that, right? And as I said, in some systems, they'll allow you to run read-only queries on, on the replicas. Now, how you actually find these replicas, that's that coordinator middleware stuff we talked about before, right? You can either explicitly in your application say, oh, I know, here's the IP address of some replica, let me go, let me go send my query there, or you send it to a middleware and says, oh, this is read-only, let me send it to, to the replica, right? And so if you can offload all the reads to the replicas, then this thing's just doing nothing but writes which are going to always typically be slower. So this allows you a lot to take the overhead and the burden off of a running read queries and put it on the replicas. Some cases, this is OK. Like if you, again, if you don't really care about having the most up-to-date uh, uh, view of the database, which will be a reoccurring theme throughout the entire uh, lecture, then this is fine. But if you need to have exactly, here's the most latest version, uh, then you, you, know, you have to run on the primary. Because I haven't said yet, how long is this going to take? Right? We'll get there in a second. So in multi-primary, you have, again, the, every, every node can, is considered the primary or, uh, and can take reads and writes. So now what happens if you have a, uh, two, uh, two transactions that do writes, uh, you know, one down here, one down here, you have to propagate those updates across these guys and then decide, you know, coordinate who's allowed to commit and, and see the latest version. 
right? So this is less common because this is hard to do. Um, and a lot of times people will start with something like this. And then if this thing becomes the bottleneck, the right node, then you got to switch to something like this. Right? It actually doesn't necessarily have to be a bottleneck, right? It could just be that the geographical distance between these, the primary and the, and the, the, and the replicas is really far. So example I always like to use is, is was Facebook. Like in the old days, 2010-ish, right? So yeah, over, over a decade ago, Facebook uh, used this model. So the data center was somewhere in California for the primary, but then all the, the replicas are all across the world, right? So if you, if you were down in Brazil and did an update to your timeline, whatever it's called now, right? That would again get sent back up, shipped up to, to California, stored in that data center, and then eventually it would get propagated down to the replicas, right? Down in Brazil and whatever other countries, right? Of course, what's the problem with that? Okay, you have to, you know, you have to go geographical distance and, and, and get, you know, and get propagated back. And then so if someone like, you know, posts a cat picture on, on their timeline, clicks submit, but then refreshes the page, that, that page refresh is going to pull the data from the database, but it's going to pull from its local replica, and it's not going to see the updates. So people aren't, aren't going to see their own you know, timeline updates. So Facebook played a little game by putting something in a, a cookie in your browser so that when you refresh, you saw your own writes locally, not actually from the database. Right? So they hid that, all that from you. But eventually, they had to switch to this model. Because you know, for doing, for, in things we're doing updates, so you, and you can't just put the browser cookie trick in. Uh, you know, they, they, had to, they had to scale it this way. All right, so next issue we got to consider is case safety. And this is a, a, I think this is primarily a database term, but the idea here is that it's the number of failures that your distributed database system is, is going to be allowed to have before it decides that uh, it doesn't want to proceed any further because it may end up losing data if there's, if there, if there's more failures, right? This is sort of like you know, think like a quorum write, same same kind of idea as what we talked about before. But it's basically saying how many time, how many nodes can go down for a uh, for all the replicas I have of a given object in my database before I decide that this is enough, right? And we'll see this in a second when we talk about the cap theorem. But like in a distributed relational database, like a well, say traditional, but like a in the relational database world, we typically we don't like losing data. We care about acid. And so we don't want to have a bunch of nodes go down and say there's like one last copy of, a, of an object. We do a write to it, but then we crash. And then now there's, you know, that, we, you know, that portion of the database is now missing. So sometimes you would say, I'll, I'll, I need to have at least two copies of, of every object in my database uh, for my database to consider online. And if I, go, if, I, if I go below that threshold, then the system just stops. It doesn't accept any new requests. There's, there's self-healing models. There's, there's other tricks like that. You can say, all right, I've gone along the threshold, so let me make a copy of this data now before I run out any queries so that you know, now, you know, I can start running more, query, running more queries after I make another copy to go above the, the threshold. But again, the, there's different ways to handle that. All right, so I've already told, alluded to this as well. But the next is the propagation scheme. So this is how we're going to decide when and how we will propagate the changes from a primary to a replica. And th this is whether it's the primary replica model or the, the multi-home, multi-primary model, right? And there's basically two approaches. And there's obviously there's different degrees of, of, uh, of propagation or, or strength you want to have between these different, um, these, different uh, these two approaches. But we'll just take the, the, the two major ones, the two, the two extremes. The first is synchronous commits, or what is called strong consistency in the distributed database world, or sorry, distributed systems world. And the idea here is that if I do an update to an object that may have multiple copies or multiple replicas, then I don't get an acknowledgment back to my application that my change has been committed or saved until all the replicas have been updated and agreed to, be, to, to have been updated, or they agreed the transaction has committed. Eventual consistency means that if I do a write, it'll eventually get propagated to the replicas, but I'll get a response back potentially before they, they get updated. So if you, if you have, you know, yes, question. Uh, no, so like, how would you make sure you'll eventually be consistent if you never get any sort of response? Right, so his question is, how do you make sure you're eventually, you'll be eventually consistent if there's no guarantee that you get a response? We'll get that in a second, yes. The answer is, eh, right? Like, you'll get there eventually, but when? Other questions? 
Yes. Um, so in a multi-family setting, how do we prevent um, simultaneous you know, updates to mm. the same object? How do we be consistent? Because you allow writes on both the primary nodes, right? Yeah, going back here. So the question is, in multi-primary, how do I prevent writes from occurring on the same object? Yeah. Two-phase locking, OCC, all that. But distribute across the two nodes. So you basically you run two-phase locking across multiple nodes, oh. right? Again, it, it's it's just the same protocols. It's just now we're distributed, and now like someone's got to build the weights for a graph, assuming it's two-phase locking, and someone's going to have to decide. Okay, there's a deadlock. Let me ha let me go ahead and kill it. And that, that could be either a, the, the centralized coordinator, or it could be amongst the nodes. They say, OK, well, I'm waiting for this, and you have this, but you update it. Like, and then, every, then the two nodes decide, OK, yeah, there's a deadlock here. And then there's some other ordering scheme decide, you know, that, determine the priority of who gets killed. But so all the stuff we talked about before is still here. So we don't worry about, say, the network traffic or anything that switches them off? When you say we don't worry about the network traffic? I mean, so the latency in terms of um, updating any data Yeah, so, so his statement is, and he's correct, that like in a distributed system, and we said this before but between parallel systems and, and distributed systems, in a distributed system, the, the communication latency is going to be much higher. The cost is much higher. We do worry about it, but like we can't, there's no magic wand to make it go away. We're, we're kind of limited by the speed of light. So uh, we will see this in, in, in Spanner in a second. Like the trick they basically do is say, well, I'll wait to see. I'll wait for a certain amount of bound of time to see whether someone shows up that may conflict with my transaction. And if that if they don't show up and they're in that, in that time, then I'm allowed to commit, right? But there's like, there's no way to get around that. Yeah. Like there's no magic two phase locking you can do because you're no, you're going to like the wide area network. It's going to be basically the stuff we talked about before. And the tricks, the games they play is like, how much hints can you pass along to say, okay, yeah, by the way, like I'm, I'm gonna, instead of saying one message at a time, here's, here's all the locks you need to acquire, it's say, like, here's the locks I'm gonna acquire, and here's the locks I think I'm gonna acquire, and maybe you do more pessimistic things like that. That's really all you really can do. Okay. So going back. Um, all right, propagation team. So, synchronous commit. Uh, or synchronous propagation. So the idea here is that when the primary sends a, uh, uh, or when the application send, sends a commit request to the primary, the primary is, will, will, will send that request to, the, uh, to all its replicas, and it has to wait until they come back and say, yes, I've, I've got this change, I've, I've go ahead and committed, I flushed the changes to the disk, uh, and then once it gets acknowledgement from all its, its uh, from its replicas that things have, are durable and safe, or the transaction is allowed to commit, uh, then and only then can it propagate the acknowledgement back to the application. Right? It's just like before when we committed transactions with the write ahead log, except now we've got to wait for somebody else over the network to come back and say they got it too. Right? A synchronous commit is, is at a high level is basically all right, commit message shows up. I'll, I'll send the request to my replicas, but I'm not going to wait for them to come back. I'll immediately say, yep, I got it, commit, right? And what I was saying before that there's sort of like, you know, these are two extremes. There's a bunch of games you can play about how, how, you know, sh how much can you really wait or how, how much should you wait, All right? So going back here to the one, the one at the top, um, so say, like, say there was like four replicas. But instead of me for waiting for acknowledgement from all four, maybe I waited for two out of four or one out of four. So at least know it's propagated on, on at least one, right? Same thing for the asynchronous one, right? So I send my, I send my requests out, maybe I wait for some of them. We saw this with uh, consistent hashing in Cassandra, right? They do quorum writes. So you could say, all right, I, my, my, every, every tuple is, is replicated th you know, three times. I'll wait for two out of three responses from my replicas before I say, tell the outside world that my, my data has been uh, saved. I don't, want to use, I don't want to use the term transaction committed in Cassandra because they don't, they don't use uh, newer versions, maybe support it, but not, not the older versions. They didn't support multi-object updates. They didn't support transactions. Or they definitely didn't support multi-node up transactions. Um, for our purposes, assume that like, you know, we're updating things just on, just on a single, single node. 
So again, there's pros and cons to all of these, right? And there isn't one scheme that's going to be universal for everyone. It depends on the tolerance of the organization or the company running your database. It depends what the application is. If it's like posts on Reddit and Twitter and Hacker News, then like, you know, if I lose something, eh, maybe no big deal, right? Uh, but if it's your bank, then you don't want to lose anything and you want to make sure everything is, 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 is fully committed. And so the, the NoSQL guys are saying, oh, yeah, you don't want to be, to be web scale, support you know, online applications, a lot of users. You want to use asynchronous commit or, or eventual consistency. And then the traditional database people say, oh, you don't want to lose any data. And you want, to, you, you, know, you want fully asset transactions, even though you're across multiple nodes. Um, and so the answer is, the, 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 again, the correct answer is it's somewhere in between. Some applications, yes. Some applications, no. But the difference with the NoSQL guys, they said straight up no. And they never had it, at least in the beginning. And they eventually had it, had, had it back. Whereas the relational database systems started off adding transactions, and then they, added, uh, and they eventually relaxed it a little bit. And I would argue it's better off starting with a you know, full transactional strong consistency support and then dial it back as needed rather than like trying to shoehorn it after you've already built the system. All right, the next is when, when are the changes actually propagated? So again, in my example here, I just showed like on commit, tell the, outside, you know, tell the other replica I, I want to go ahead and apply my changes. But let's say that I'm doing a transaction that updates a lot of data. And it's a lot of round trips between the application server and, and the data server. Because it's like, do, do one update, do another update, and so forth. Do I want to wait for the, I get the commit message before I propagate those changes to the, to the replica? Maybe not, right? Because maybe like, as the updates come in, I can start sending them piecemeal to the replicas so that when I go ahead and commit, you know, they don't have to apply a bunch of those changes. They've already seen a bu bunch of those things. But then that now means that if I roll back the transaction, they've already applied a bunch of changes that, that I have to then reverse. But again, this is sort of like what I was saying before. Like the, the replicas are more or less in recovery mode, ignoring multi-home, uh, because like, they're just replaying these log messages, uh, and they're, they're maintaining the uh, undo state or undo buffer just as you would during regular recovery. So most systems do the top one. Um, if you do the bottom one, it does make it easier to, to implement. But again, it just it makes the commit process a bit longer because now you, you batch up a bunch of uh, updates you have to apply. All right, this one's a bit nuanced and always confuses students. Uh, so ask questions if it just makes sense. So then there's a the question of what are the transactions actually, or what are the nodes actually doing uh, that are involved in, say, like a, a multi-node transaction? And so the two ideas are active, active versus active, passive. So active, passive is what I've been sort of describing so far, where there's some primary, the, the queries go there, they do updates, and then they get propagated to the, to the replicas. And the replicas are eventually, they're not really running the queries, they're doing the work, they're just replaying the updates that occurred on the primary. With active, active, the idea is that when I execute a transaction, it's going gonna, it's gonna to actually execute the logic of that transaction at every replica. And that when you go to now commit, you don't need to send like, hey, here's my updates from the write ahead log, because they all did the same thing. I right? think of like, I, I have an update query, ignoring random, ignoring times, and all that other stuff. That like, I, assuming I can execute it term, deterministically, I send it to the two nodes, and they're both executed in the exact same order and produce the exact same result. So now when they go to commit, they just need to agree, yep, I did this, yep, you did that, and, and you're done. So most systems do this bottom one because it's just easier. Because again, you're just piggybacking off of the, uh, the uh, you're piggyback off of the, the, the right load mechanism. Um, but the top one is, if you can do it, it's, it's way more efficient because you're just sending less data. It's similar to that, the push versus pushing, pushing the data, to, sorry, pushing the, the query to the data versus pulling the data to the query, yes. Does active active kind of defeat the purpose of being able to run a lot of requeries on replicas? The question is, does active active defeat the purpose of being able to run a lot of requeries on replicas? Yes. question is, when do, you, when do you want to do this? If the, um, if the amount of data you have to send to say, here's the transaction, is going to be less than, like, here's the, here's the, the right ahead log updates, then it may potentially use better. It also reduces the window of the synchronization time as well. 
because now, like, again, assuming the, the two nodes are, have the same speed, send the request, they rip through it, and then you just commit. Whereas, like, think of the other, the, in the, the active passive, I got to run the query, generate the write-head log messages after I run the query, then send the updates that then get propagated, whereas the other two can potentially happen at the exact same time. His question is, if, if you do active-active and you don't end up with the exact same result, what do you do? It's, you have to abort the transaction. That's why most people don't do it. Yeah. Yes? Uh, so with active-active, wouldn't we need to send a lot more traffic over the network? His question is, with active-active, would, wouldn't you need to send a lot more, tra uh, lot more uh, network, a lot more data over the, tra over the network? Yeah. Why? So the statement is, and, it, and the answer is, of course, in data, it depends. The statement is, with active-active, you would have to send the query. Uh, with active-passive, you have to send a write-ahead log. And couldn't the write-ahead log, the, the records, be larger than the query? Well, it depends. Like, I have a single update query that updates a billion tuples, and I could just send that single string, and that, that's enough to update a billion things, right? So I don't want to go too much into this, but the, the, to handle the... Uh, all of these problems, if you can run your transactions as store procedures, which we haven't really talked about, but think of like an RPC. Like I literally have a function that I can put inside my database system that has, you know, if then else statements, things you can't easily do in SQL, for loops and all that, it's procedural code that then makes invocations of SQL queries. Now the application, when it wants, wants to run a transaction, doesn't say, okay, begin a transaction, update this query, get a response, update next query, and so forth, right? You literally say, you know, execute this function with this input parameters, and then that runs on the database server. Right, this is very common in enterprise systems, uh, in order, order systems. And so if you can run everything as, as store procedures, now you act, the database system actually can look inside the code and figure out what's going on and flag anything. Oh, there's a timestamp call. There's a random function and so forth, right? And then you can play a bunch of games of like uh, making sure that like when you send the, the, that function request to the different servers to do active-active replication, it's guaranteed to execute in the exact same order. Actually, the way you handle random and timestamp is you, you, you basically piggyback on the, 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 the request has to go to one server. That server assigns like, hey, if you ever called timestamp, here's the timestamp. If you ever called random, here's the starting seed. And then that way you send that information along with the, the, the request to any other server. So when they execute it, they'll get things running in the exact same order. That assumes, though, you're running th transaction requests in the exact same order, which you can do with serializability. And that's why we care about that. Okay. Again, most of them will be, will be active passive, uh, but there's, there's active active. If you can do it, not not all systems can. Uh, provides a lot of benefits. All right. So now we got to talk about how we actually want to get everyone to agree that we want to commit transactions. Um, and out of curiosity, who here has taken a distributed systems course, either CMU or somewhere else? All right. So more than half. Okay. So some of this will be somewhat redundant. Um, but again, I, I want to focus on the things we care about in the context of databases. And so the, in the distributed systems literature, they'll call this uh, state machine replication or log replication. And the way to think about it in the context of databases, the, the thing we're trying to get around to coordinate on is the order in which transactions are committed. And that's essentially our state machine, right? This transaction committed followed by this transaction and this transaction, right? And it's not so much like here's the changes that they made. We know what those changes are because that, that's part of our log. But like the higher level thing that we're trying to order is the, the commit order. Because if you say here's the commit order of my transactions, along with that is the, is the metadata that says here's the changes that they made. So if you get the commit order right and, and you piggyback the changes that, that the transactions made, then you can propagate that to all the nodes and then everyone will be, will be synchronized in order. Right? So for the thing we'll talk about now is this doesn't matter whether the database system is going to be partitioned or replicated. We still want to do this to get everyone to agree that this is the order that transactions are, are going to commit. So there's a bunch of different, pro actually, I take that back. There, there, there's not a lot of protocols that do this because it's really hard. Uh, these are the, ma the main ones uh, that show up in databases. Two-phase commit is the, is the original one. Um, and this was originally thought to be invented by Jim Gray. Uh, at IBM, he won the 21 in databases in the 90s. 
But in the there's a famous transaction book where he actually attributes it to this other dude in Italy who implemented two phase commit uh, for like a, a, one of the early databases that they built for the Italian social security system in the early 1970s. But even then, the idea of two phase commit comes from the real world. It comes from contract law, right? If, if you, if, between legal arrangements between humans, right? So the, the idea of two phase commit is, is sort of it's, it's implemented in database systems or implemented in distributed systems, but it, the idea predates, uh, predates, predates computing. Um, then there's three phase commit, and that's from Stonebreaker. Nobody actually does this. We can ignore it. Uh, view stamp replication is considered to be the first uh, uh, sort of consensus protocol that was, that was shown to be correct uh, and can handle uh, liveness issues. Um, and that was invented uh, by Barbara Liskoff, who won the Turing Award a few years ago uh, at MIT in 1988. Paxos is probably the one everyone also heard about. This was invented a, a year later, um, but it didn't, it didn't, the paper itself didn't come out till, till the 90s. I'll explain why in a second. Zab is from the Apache Zookeeper people, the Zookeeper Atomic Broadcast Protocol. That's roughly 2008. And then Raft is another popular one um, that was invented at Stanford in 2013. And this is the one that uh, you know, sort of in vogue now, if you're building a distributed database system, you, oftentimes you would use Raft. Um, but for this talk, or for this lecture, we're only going to focus on two-phase commit and Paxos. Uh, Raft is considered to be a more readable, understandable version of Paxos. And the, the sort of the key difference is that there's fewer node types or participant types in, in, the, in the network. And then when you do leader election, you, in, you, only the, the nodes that have the most updated log, they're allowed to go for election, where Paxos, anybody can, right? View stamp replication of VSR, again, this is sort of becoming popular now because there's a, there's a distributed database out of South Africa called Tiger, Be called Tiger Beetle that's written in Zig, which is like Rust but more rare. Uh, and then you also use uh, VSR for that. OK, so here's two-phase commit. Basic idea is that there's an application server. Again, we can ignore whether this is actually going through middleware or, or, or whatever. It doesn't matter. That they made a bunch of updates to the database. We don't care whether it's partitioned or replicated. It doesn't matter. They want to say, OK, I want to commit my transaction. And so the commit request is going to be going to some node. We said it was the primary. But in the two-phase commit parlance, it would be called the coordinator. And then the other nodes that were involved in the transaction, they'll just be called participants. So two-phase commit sounds like, like what it's, it is what it sounds like. right? It's two phases. So in the first phase, it's called prepare phase. You send a message. The coordinator sends a message to all the nodes, the participants, and say, hey, there's this transaction. It's got this ID, whatever, whatever metadata or, or identification you want to use. Go ahead and prepare to commit. And they come back and they vote and say, yes. OK, yes, we want to commit this. And then once you get all the, the OKs from the, all the participants, then you go through the second phase and say, OK, guys, go ahead and commit. You send the, the, that message to them. They come back with OK. And once you get all of them from the, uh, from the participants, then you're allowed to go and tell the application that this transaction has committed. Now, what I'm not showing here is that on every node, we're going to actually be recording in our write-ahead log. Here's all the messages that we, we got, and here's our response to them. And we flush that to disk. So that way, if there's a crash and we come back, the node can look on the log and say, well, I was involved in this transaction. Not, so it at least knows about it, and it knows that it voted a certain way. So that, again, if, if there's node failure, we can come back and, and reason about what was the state of the system uh, when why we were committing transactions in you know at the time of the, of the failure, right? So another key thing about uh, in two-phase commit is that we have to wait for all the OKs to come back from the, all the participants before we enter the next phase, or before we tell the outside world that transactions committed. That's gonna be different than Paxos. Paxos has to wait for majority, Raft as well, right? And I'll talk about this in a second. But basically, two-phase commit is a degenerative case of Paxos. right? But it has this, this liveness issue where any one node can take the whole thing down because you're waiting for it until, until you time out. All right, so this is a success for abort. Uh, say the application server says, says a commit request. We send the prepare message out to everyone. Uh, one of them, for whatever reason, we don't care. We don't know why comes back and says abort. And if one, one participant in the, in, the, in, the, in the network says we want to abort this transaction, then immediately we can tell the outside world that our transaction has aborted. And then we enter the abort phase, we, and we send all the abort messages to everyone. 
So even though another, one node might have said, oh, yeah, I really want to commit this transaction. I love it or whatever. Uh, if we get one abort, we have to kill the whole thing. If the coordinator tells us we have to fail, we, uh, we have to fail, right? And then they, they send back their knowledge and we log all of this. Pretty simple, right? Yes? So is this, is this for active active only? So the question is, is this for active active? Why would it be only for active active? Because we're, okay, so we're like checking the other nodes if it's okay. Is that implied the other nodes are running the, the, the query? The statement is, because we're checking the other nodes um, whether it's okay to commit, does that assume they're running the other query? The other, this doesn't matter. You have to have someone be the coordinator. Someone has to say, okay, guys, we're committing. It doesn't matter what, how node and two got, were propagated with the updates. The active passive, active active, doesn't matter. Okay, so I guess in what case does it send abort then if they're only propagating updates? So the question is, in what case does, does, does it send abort? So there could be another coordinator committing another transaction and no three is involved in it, and for whatever reason, it can, it, it can commit the, that guy's transaction, but not this one. Yes? Just to be clear, participants aren't limited to replicas, right? Question, your statement is participants, aren't, participants, participants are not uh, limited to replicas. Correct, yes. Right, so it could be multi-home, the multi-primary. It's just, again, when a transaction commits, someone has to be in charge, right? Okay, so as I said, all the inbound and outbound messages we have, we have to store on disk, uh, and we have to flush them, like, like, like the Red Head log. And then when we crash, we come back. Uh, if we see that, uh, if, our, if we could look in our log, and we see that we were in this prepared state, uh, meaning like we got, we got a request to prepare the transaction, uh, and we said, yeah, let's go ahead and prepare it, but then we didn't see whether that the, the vote was successful or not, then when the node comes back, it contacts the coordinator to get the updates for the log, right? We figure out what it missed. If the transaction was not in the prepared state, uh, then we assume that it was aborted um, because if I was involved in the transaction on our two-base commit and then I crashed, clearly couldn't have committed. So I, 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 I'm going to correctly assume that it was, it was, abor you know, it was aborted. Um, if, the, uh, if the transaction was committing, and the, the node that fails is the coordinator. Um, then when I come back up, I just send out again, hey, guys, uh, you, know, you may have, may have missed this, but I'm pretty sure you were supposed to get this. This transaction is committed. Of course, now again, I have to, the other nodes have to wait for that coordinator to come back up and come back online. Or at some point, there'll be a timeout, and they say, oh, well, that coordinator is dead. He's never coming back. This transaction is aborted. Right? But again, one node going down can take down the whole thing. So, all right, what happens if the coordinator crashes? I've already said this, right? They have to decide what they have to do after timeout. And again, the system is not available during this time. And available means like I, I can't take any new queries. Uh, I could take read queries if I'm, if I'm okay for things being a little loosey goosey if you, if you don't want that strong consistency guarantee. Um, but if, I can't take any writes because I can't, be, can't propagate those writes because I, until I find out what the transactions before, before me actually did. And then if a participant crashes, the coordinator is going to assume that it just hasn't responded and, and it's going to be abort. Um, and then we just time out and say, okay, this guy's dead, and then we just abort the transaction. All right? So there are two optimizations we can do in two phase commit. The first is called early prepare voting, which is, which is actually very rare. Um, and you can only do this with the, the active active, um, active active approach I talked about before and with store procedures. I think. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, no, sorry, to think about it. You could do it with the JDBC, uh, but the, 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 the wire protocol of database systems doesn't, that doesn't support this technique. But you can do this. Some systems can do this if you do store procedures. And then the one that's more common is, is early acknowledgement after prepare. So early prepare voting is if I'm sending a query request to another node, and I know this is the last time, the last query I'm ever going to execute on that node for this transaction. Then I piggyback on my message and say, hey, execute this query. And oh, by the way, I'm going to commit pretty soon. I'm never going to come back and ask, for you, ask you to run another query. So go tell me what, you, what your vote's going to be for two-phase commit. So you get the query response back and actually the, the vote on the prepare phase, all in one round, round trip. 
early acknowledgement after a prepare is basically if I get the acknowledgement on the coordinator from all of the participants that this transaction is going to commit, then I don't wait until the I get the acknowledgements from the from the commit phase. I immediately send back the the commit message to the application, the acknowledgement back to the application. Because at that point, I assume that if there's a crash and I come back, then the, the coordinator or the nodes will, will look in the log and say, OK, we all agree to commit this transaction. So let's go ahead and actually apply the change. So there's a small window where, like, it, it, sorry, there is not a window where you could crash and lose data, but there, it, will take, it will make recovery a little bit longer. So it looks like this, right? So I get my commit request. I do my prepare phase. They all come back and say, OK, uh, go ahead and commit. And then immediately, once I get back all the OKs, I can send back the success. And then I still then have to do the, the commit phase and get, get that round trip. Again, all of this is written to the log, which not everyone always does. Uh, or oh, you know, oh, Not everyone always flushes it. Um, but most systems doing two-phase commit are, are going to do this, this simple optimization. Because the the window the failure window is, is pretty small. Yes. Is it still important to do two PC if we're doing asynchronous? So this question is, do we still need to do two phase commit if we're doing asynchronous commits? Uh, you should, because uh, you want everyone to say, okay, did we all agree that this is the update that, that happened? Uh, you don't have to though. It makes You'd have to do more work on recovery. Um, but you could potentially not use two-phase commit. I think that's true, yes. Yeah, I think a lot of the NoSQL systems, when they did that propagation, they weren't using two-phase commit. OK. So Paxos is, as I said, is, is considered a superset to two-phase commit. Um, and this was the the. I think this was the first correct protocol that was uh, provably resilient in the, in the face of asynchronous networks. But again, it wasn't the first one that actually could do this. View stamp replication came, came before it. Um, and so the, the idea is basically that we're going to send out votes just like before. Um, but instead of having all the participants come back and acknowledge that you know, this transaction is allowed to commit, you, just, you need a majority. And then for the ones that are in the minority, they basically are treated as, as failures or fail, failing, and they have to basically crash, pseudo crash, and then replay the log to get them back up to, sta up to, up to, to the correct state. And this is going back to what I was saying before. This is why we don't care about Byzantine fault tolerance in, 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 this, in the real world, well, this world, uh, because it's not like someone's going to vote no because they want to <laughs> right? Uh, when everyone else is going to commit, there's something, you know, really wrong with it uh, or the network and but when it comes back it can get back up up to up to date right assuming that you know, and there's no massive hardware failures so the the original Paxos paper I think is there a date on this yeah 1998 um, the Lamport actually wrote the paper in 89 uh, but who, actually who here has ever read the Paxos paper one two it's a wild read, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's crazy. Uh, it's basically he's trying to be very uh, illustrative and 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 not poetic, but he was trying to instead of just saying here's the protocol, like it does this, this, and this, and this, he describes it as if he's like an archaeologist finding this ancient Greek tribe on the island of Paxos and how they would do voting by put, throwing tablets in a hole and then coming back later and to, to read them, right? Like it's 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 this. I mean, it's it's amusing. Uh, but like, if you really try to read and understand what the hell it's actually trying to do, you can't. Um, and so the story goes is that um, if you go to actually if you go to Leslie Lamport's website uh, and you go look at his, his bibliography, which is kind of cool, he lists like for every single paper, at least for the, the the major ones, he lists like what he was doing in his daily life when he wrote the paper, like who, what he was eating, who he's dating, and so forth, right? And so he talks about in the Paxos paper when he submitted it with this Greek archaeology story inside of it. Uh, it got rejected, and he says, like, oh, the reviewers were stupid because like, they couldn't appreciate my genius or whatever. Um, and so when I was in grad school, I took a distributed systems course, and I presented the Paxos paper, and I started going on about, like, oh, yeah, this paper is brilliant, and like, the reviewers were super, you know, they were stupid for rejecting his, you know, he was a genius. 
Turns out, though, the professor teaching it, this was back at Brown, is, uh, was Maurice Hurley. He used, used to be here at CMU. And he, he's like, yeah, I actually was one of the reviewers on this paper. <laughs> and the story goes is that they were okay with, what he says, they were okay with all the Greek stuff. They just wanted him to add an, add an appendix with like, a, you know, a, with an algorithm and like a proof to showing that what the thing actually was. And Leslie Lamport was apparently super stub stubborn, didn't want to change anything in the paper because he thought it was perfect as is. So it got rejected. They put it in his filing cabinet or put it in his, in his shelf and didn't do anything with it for like 10 years. And then over the 90s, people started publishing papers that sort of like dancing around the problem that he already saw back in 89. Um, he actually was not aware of view state replication, which came out in 88. Uh, but then once, once he saw enough papers trying to kind of barking up the same tree as Paxos, then he put the original Paxos paper out, along with another paper called Paxos Made Simple, which is not simple. It's, um, but there, actually, the one paper, if you want to read a Paxos paper, the, the Google one, Paxos Made Live, that's the one that, like, for me, clicked. And I was like, oh, okay, now I understand what they're, what they're doing. But then once you know that it's actually just a degenerative case of two-phase commit, at least for me, coming from the database world, then it, it makes sense. So there's this paper here. This is 2003 or five. Uh, 2006, from Jim Gray and Leslie Lamport. This is right before Jim Gray got lost at sea, where they basically show, they prove that two-phase commit is, a, again, is a subset of, of Paxos. All right. So again, and RAF is going to be basically the same idea here. It's just going to have fewer node types. And actually, I'm not even going to show, there's, a, there's another node type in Paxos called learners. We can ignore that. Nobody, I don't think anybody does that. Um, or they just, the, the nodes have multiple roles, so it doesn't matter. Um, but again, in, in Paxos, when they do a leader election, any node can be a leader. Uh, but in RAF, they choose the ones that have the most update logs. That's sort of the major distinction. So going back to our example here, now we have three nodes. Our transaction goes, goes ahead and commit. Uh, the Paxos, instead of calling them coordinators and participants, they're going to call them proposer and acceptors. Again, there's a learners. We, we can ignore that. We send out the proposed that we want to commit this transaction. Say this one, this one node three here goes down for whatever reason, doesn't matter. And then we get back the, the agreements from the other two nodes. And since we got two out of three of the nodes agree that we can commit this transaction, the transaction is allowed to, uh, well, we do the commit phase. And then the transaction is allowed, allowed to commit, right? And eventually, when node three comes back up, it can learn about the, uh, what, you know, the, the changes that it missed, right? So another way to look at it is, is, is often this, this sort of timeline graph here, right? Where you have a proposer says, I want to commit transaction with you know, timestamp n, right? Again, think of the log as just an ordered list. So here's the transaction that I want to commit. So the, the first guy says, I want, to I want to commit transaction n. So all the acceptors get that. They agree to do it. But during this time, another proposer comes along and says, I, want to, I propose to commit transaction n plus 1. And then soon the acceptors see a new timestamp value that's greater than uh, anyone's seen in the past, anything that comes after that is, is automatically rejected. So the log is always sort of moving forward. You never move, move backwards. So now when this other guy says, I want to go ahead and commit, again, assuming we're not doing the early, early acknowledgement optimization, go ahead and commit. Because these acceptors already saw n, they reject it and say, I can't take n because I've seen n plus 1. So now they can go ahead and agree to commit n plus 1, uh, commit that. And then this other guy here, he can then re resubmit the, the resubmit his request to c commit that transaction. So in this world, we have multiple proposers proposing to commit transactions, and obviously that's going to be problematic because you're going to have this contention of of everyone trying to over clobber each other. Yes. In this example, would two PC actually be the same? Because I, it looks like um, like you said the difference is in majority basically, right? But it looks like. Here, they're all responding at the same time in concordance with each other. So the statement is, um, would two-phase commit have the same problem uh, if you have multiple coordinators? Yes. So the, again, the, the way we're going to handle this is through leases to limit the number of, or limit which node can, can propose commit transaction. Like basically, how to anoint which one's going to be the, 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 the primary, which one's going to be the, the, the coordinator, or the proposer for a distributed database system. So this, this came from a, a Google paper called Multi-Paxos. Multi the idea here is that you run leader election every so often to say, OK, this node here is anointed as the proposer. And then in some cases, now you can skip the proposed phase 
because now the coordinator or the proposer are going to say, here's the transaction I want to go ahead and commit. Everyone agree that we're all going to commit this, right? And then if any time there's a failure, either like the node, go, you know, the, the leader goes down or some node goes down, then you just run the leader election all over again, which is Jen just running Paxos, right? Because again, think of the state machine is here's the order in which transactions commit, and as part of that state machine, here's the which which node is the proposer or the coordinator, right? So you would send heartbeats out between the the different nodes to figure out who's actually alive and and, and responding to requests. And if you, if you don't get a heartbeat with a certain amount of time, then you say, okay, this this node is is, is down, and run rerun leader election, right? And then you set the least time out to be like, okay, after every 10 minutes or so, then I automatically run uh, leader election all over again. And maybe the case, I just reelect the same leader, which is ideal, uh, but at least you're, you're running that election over and over again. And different systems are going to run that leader election at different time intervals. Spanner runs it every 10 seconds. Yugabyte is every like 30 seconds. And I think Cockroach in the source code is like every five minutes. And again, it depends on how reactive you want to be to the uh, to the um, you know to, to failures, Yugabyte is two seconds. Yugabyte is less than Spanner. It's two seconds, um, All right? But again, generally this this technique is is, is, is falls under the umbrella called multi paxos So most people say they're running Paxos. They're they're, they're most often running multi paxos All right. Again, I've already covered this all already. But the, the the main idea is the main difference between two phase commit Paxos and Raft. Is there a two-phase commit that if the coordinator fails or any node fails, we have to block until the coordinator comes back? In Paxos, as long as the majority of our participants are alive uh, and we've waited long enough to make sure that, that uh, there's no further failures, then we can go ahead and commit. And Raft, as I said, is going to be basically the same thing, fewer, fewer node roles. And uh, when you do a leader election, you choose the ones that have the most updated logs. Yes? Sorry, what were the node types for Paxos? Paxos has uh, proposers acceptors, and then there's learners, which are just sort of downstream from the acceptors to say, hey, here's the changes. That, here's, the, here's what we just committed. We can ignore that. OK. So most of the modern distributed data systems are going to be running Paxos or Raft. Raft is probably way more common than Paxos, uh, just because when it came out in 2013, a bunch of people took the protocol and they re-implemented it in different languages. So like there, for a long time, there wasn't like a lib Paxos you could download. It's like, oh, let, let me put this in my, my distributed database. But in Wrath, there was a bunch of uh, uh, correct implementations in Rust, or Rust wasn't around, but like in Go and in Python and in C++. So like there were a bunch of libraries that you could just plop in and get Wrath consensus out of that. So I think that helped uh, uh, evangelize it a bit more. Yes? What's the difference between multi-Paxos and Wrath? His, his question is, what's the difference between multi-Paxos and Wrath? Same thing. Oh, really? You, just, you run leader election. Multiplex is like 2004, 5-ish. Then what did Raft invent? Uh, I mean, um, his question is, what did Raft invent? Yeah, oh, so like, the, again, the, the, they don't have... It, Raft is meant to be a more understandable version of Paxos, right? At a high level, they're, they're the same, right? But the, in the terms of the implementation, you don't have to have a, these learners, you, either, either participants or, you know, or, or proposers. So there's only two node no types. When you do a leader election, then you have um, uh, you choose the one that has the most up-to-date log versus Paxos. Anybody can be the leader, uh, and I think Paxos had, or sorry, in RAF, there's explicit like timeouts for heartbeats and things like that. Where in Paxos, people add them, but I don't think the original protocol talks about those things. Yes. So I'm a little confused on multi-Paxos versus Paxos. Is the main difference that multi-Paxos will periodically shuffle where the leader is? No, the main difference in, in multi-Paxos, yeah, but. Yeah, Yes, but in in Paxos, anybody can be anybody can be a proposer. Anybody can be a leader to propose changes to updates. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, so multi Paxos and, set, so it, it elects one, and then all the changes get sent there to be coordinated. Yes, because otherwise anybody's proposing it, and you just like if you know you just clobber each other, and so you have to do like back off to like okay, why well, my transaction I I got 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 overwritten, I couldn't I couldn't commit it, so maybe wait a certain amount of time, then commit another one. So instead of like that back and forth, they say, okay, you're, you're the leader. Everything goes to you, and you, you don't worry about conflicting proposals coming in. Okay. Yes? So we technically just have one proposer. In and, and, and you technically have one proposer within some boundary 
in, in multiplexes, yes. And whether that boundary is like a rack of machines or like a data center, it depends on the implementation. All right, let's finish up. So cap theorem. So this was the hot thing in distributed systems, uh, the buzzword everyone used in the 2000s to describe their distributed database systems. And it was a way to characterize what the system could handle in the, the face of failures, right? So the cap theorem, the C is, is consistent. Uh, so basically strongly consistent. Uh, the A is always available. So if there's, if there's a failure or there's a network partition, you can still run any possible query. Um, and that's sort of tied to the network partition tolerant. What happens when the, that, there's a network partition? Can you handle updates in that environment? So it was proven to be correct the way, the way to describe systems. The idea is like you can pick two out of three, right? Way to think of like a boyfriend and girlfriend. Like are they good looking, crazy, or smart? Pick two out of three, right? <laughs> Same thing for your distributed database. Um, and so this is proven to be correct. But a very important aspect of this is that the cat theorem doesn't, describes what happens if there's a failure. But most of the times, there isn't a failure, right? So what happens when you're running no operations? So it, it got extended by Dan Abadi, who was, uh, did a lot of the early column store stuff in, at MIT and is now a professor at, at Maryland. He, the first part is the cat theorem, partition tolerant, always available, consistent. But then during normal operations, you have this trade-off between your latency tolerance and your consistency tolerance. And we'll, we'll see what that looks like in, this, in a second, right? Um, so let's go through some examples. Oh, sorry. So with consistency, the idea is that if I do a commit or a change to, to a copy of an object in my database and there's replicas, when do I tell the outside world that my, my change has, has been propagated? And can anybody see an intermediate state? Right? So we talked about this before between eventual consistency and strong consistency, same idea. So if I do an update to A here, this is the primary, this is the replica, I make the change to the primary, I then propagate the update to the replica, or if it's active-active, they both run at the same time, it doesn't matter. And then once I get the acknowledgement from the, the replica that the change is durable and safe, then I can tell the outside world my transaction is committed. So now if any other application comes along and does a read on A, they're guaranteed to see the update from the committed transaction. Right? So for single objects, all right, this, this, is, this is doable. You know, really it starts to matter when you have multiple objects. Right? If I update A and B at the same time, uh, can I guarantee that I'll see a consistent view of the database? Availability it determines what happens if there's a failure uh, to the overall system. So say my, this node goes down here for whatever reason. So my, my application server here, they can read, read the copy on the primary. That's just fine. But uh, what happens with this application server over there? Well, as, you know, assuming they can connect to this other replica, then they can still access and access its contents, read the database over there, right? I'm, you know, assuming the network has, hasn't been severed. All right, and no matter how many time, how many nodes go down, partition tolerance says if the network gets severed, and now these two nodes can't talk to each other. So, what's going to happen here under Paxos? This guy was the primary, right? And he's say he's holding the lease on that. But now that there's a, there's a, there's a, the, I, it never gets severed, so the replica I can't talk to this guy. So he says, oh, well, this guy's down. So let me run leader election. Oh, and look at that. I'm, I'm, now the, <laughs> I'm now the leader, right? So it becomes the primary. So what's the problem here? So now the first, the both applications send updates to A. Uh, both of them think they're the primary. And they said, okay, yeah, great. We'll go ahead and commit, commit your changes. That's fine. All right. And they get, you get back acknowledgement that those changes got persisted. But then now the network comes back up, and now there's a problem where they both think they're the primary, and they both think they have the latest version of the, 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 the object. But who's correct? So this is called split brain, right? And in most systems, when you have this problem, like it, this goes back to the case safety thing, is once I don't have enough copies of the of, 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 my, of my data, I, I'm going to stop the system. It's a small number of NoSQL systems back in the day used what are called vector clocks, invented by Leslie Lamport, was basically, it's almost like multi-versioning. You're keeping track of the different versions of the object over time. So now when the network gets, gets uh, connected up again, 
you said, okay, well, you have, the, you have these changes and I have these changes this time, and you merge the two vector clocks together. But then now you still have a bunch of like different copies or different versions in your database for these objects. So now in your application code, you have to write stuff to go reason about what is actually the correct version. So like you as the application program have to write a bunch of shit here that like it's, people always get wrong. It's super hard, right? So in the NoSQL world, they would, um, in some cases, they would actually still allow this to happen, but then when the, the network gets uh, you know, connected back up again, they'll just pick whatever one has the, the latest timestamp and say that that's the latest version. And whether or not that's right or wrong depends on whether the application cares or not, or, some, or someone will notice. Yes? Why would that be wrong? So question, why would that be wrong? My bank account has $100. This guy pulls out $100. This guy pulls out $100. I now come back, and now I have negative $100. That's definitely wrong. Would it be taken as more frequent one and then just ignore the other transaction? But I've already given out, but you gave out $100 twice. <laughs> right? You're happy. Bank's not happy. Right? Or think about it. It's the, it's, it's the, what are the, 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 the tuition payment. They take it out twice. You definitely would care. Right? All right, so, and again, in the cap theorem, you can kind of see, going back here quickly, you can kind of see why, like, you can't get all three of those properties, right? I can't do, uh, I can't guarantee consistency if I'm going to start doing things like allowing both sides to get updated, because that's not a consistent view of the database, right? And so what typically will happen is, like, say, you know, say you have an odd number of, 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 of replicas. I have three. So in this case here, maybe two is over here and one's over here. It knew that there was three before, but it says now I, don't, I can't get a, a majority at you know two out of three. So this guy then just says, okay, I'm not available, and then this guy would you know could run lead election just fine. All right. So okay, this is all what happens when there's a failure. But again, under normal operations, even if we have these different uh, properties under the cap theorem, there's this trade-off between how long we want to wait for changes to get propagated and acknowledged from our replicas versus uh, guaranteeing that get, everything's going to be consistent. And so again, so say uh, my application wants to do an update on A, it's going to set it to 2, but then it's going to propagate those changes to the replicas. And say these replicas are in different data centers, like you know, one's going across the country, one's going over the ocean to Europe. And now the question is, how long do we want to wait for the acknowledgments from those other replicas before we tell the application server we, we got those changes. And again, this goes back to that strong consistency versus ventral consistency. And I was saying that somewhere in the middle. So maybe the, just waiting for the, the update from, or the, the, the acknowledgement from US West, maybe that's good enough. Because now if I crash and come back, I can, I can, you know, I can make sure that the, I, you know, at least pull the change from one of the locations. But depending on like how, how much I really care about my data, which is actually not something the data system can, can, can reason about, because it depends on the application, depends on the organization, depends on whether you're a bank and, and like it's financial things, or it's like you know, some, some Macedon website, or who cares if you lose some stuff, right? So there's no hard and fast rule to say, okay, this is the right way to do this no matter what. It really depends for a human to decide what the, what the tolerance actually is. But you can clearly see how there's this trade-off between I can make sure everything's strongly consistent, but I'm going to wait for that because there's, there's, there's the speed of light issues of sending and propagating messages that I can't, you know, there's no magic wand to make that go away. Um, and then if, but, if, but if I don't wait, then I could have inconsistent data. Right? So as I said, most distributed relational database systems both the traditional ones, like the ones from the 1980s, like DB2 and Oracle Rack and others, they will, they will lean heavily towards uh, strong consistency and uh, over-availability and partition tolerance, meaning a bunch of nodes go down, they're just going to stop the world until those nodes come back up because they don't want to have inconsistent data. They don't want to cause you to, to, to you know, have integrity issues. Whereas the NoSQL guys, in the original, a lot of the original versions, they, they would not support multi-node consistency because they were trying to support high availability right? and, and be able to scale out. And they would do something really simple like last update wins. And this last one here, these, these are the vector clocks. And as I said, this is pretty rare. 
Very few systems do this. Okay? All right, in the last five minutes, let's go through what a very complicated <laughs> database system uh, that Google spent, you know, spent years and years working on called Spanner. So the background is Google was one of the biggest proponents of NoSQL systems in the day. Right? They wrote this paper called, Big, called Bigtable uh, in 2004 where they said transactions, we don't need them. SQL, we don't need that. They didn't explicitly call NoSQL, but a bunch of people read those papers and said, oh, yeah, let's build the same things Google's building because Google's making a lot of money. We want to make a lot of money. It's clearly because of their database. So a lot of people re like, re-implemented re re what Google talked about in their papers. Um, but then, so, so Bigtable came out in like 2004. It didn't have transactions. I think it, a lot of their stuff had vector clocks. Uh, where you had to reason about inconsistent data in the application code. But while everyone else in Silicon Valley was re-implementing Google's papers, Google was realizing, hey, wait, SQL and transactions are actually a good idea. And they then, over a five-year period, when NoSQL was a hot thing, they were building this thing called Spanner. Right? And what is, so what is Spanner? It's a, at least the original version was not relational database system. It was, it didn't support SQL. They eventually added that. Um, but it's going to be a decentralized shared disk architecture using log structure on disk storage. And for the concurrency control, it's going to hit all of our favorite buzzwords we talked about this, this semester. They're going to do strict 2PL, multi-version concurrency control, multi-paxos, and two-phase commit. And now hopefully, you know, at this point in the semester, all these words will start clicking. And you see, oh yeah, I know what those things are. And you can see now, when you see them in, in the context of someone describing a database system, you now can get a big picture of what they're actually doing, whether it actually makes sense. Right? Now, the one thing Google does that is very rare that most people don't do is that they're going to support what is called external consistency or strict or strong serializability, which I think we might have talked about. And the basic idea here is that the commit order of transactions is going to be equivalent to the arrival order of transactions, which is not something we talked about when we talked about you know, serializability on, on, the, on a single node. We said, oh, yeah, you know, this transaction could, could arrive after this one, but could still commit for the other one. In their world, they need to guarantee that transactions arrive in this, or get committed in the same order that they arrive. They claim in the paper it's because of like uh, something about ads, right? They built Spanner for for running their the behemoth ad infrastructure. Very few people need this, uh, and very few systems actually support this. We we can ignore lock free transactions for now. So the the way it's going to work is that they're going to guarantee the ordering of uh, of transactions through globally unique timestamps that are going to be generated through a combination of atomic clocks and GPS uh, receivers in every data center. So they're going to have some satellite dish on top of every single uh, data center to pull down the timestamps coming out of the GPS satellites. And now, it's not going to guarantee that uh, timestamps are going to, sorry, it's not going to guarantee that it knows the exact ordering at any given time for any transaction, but it's going to allow us to bound how long we have to wait before we expect a transaction to show up with a lower timestamp than our transaction when we have to commit. And that's the novel aspect about this. Because otherwise, uh, you know, if you want to do this global ordering across different data centers, across the wide area network, you're going to have to wait. But because the clocks could be skewed uh, you know, slightly off from every one data center to another, you might have to wait a little bit longer than, than you would otherwise uh, if, you, if you have this. And as far as, as far as I know, I don't know of any other People, I don't know any other company that publicly talks about having this kind of infrastructure. The high frequency trading, guy, trading guys might, but they don't write papers and they don't share what they're doing because they're, they're too busy counting their money. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, fun fact, when I was, when I was in grad school, um, one of my early years, I was sponsored by, uh, through the research funding was, was sponsored by um, this company at Chicago who their claim to fame was they, they, in the 90s, they figured out if you put the database server on the floor above the stock exchange, you make money faster. Uh, they obviously did a lot more stuff since then, but like this thing that they were telling me they would do was, was insane. Like these, you know, we're talking about like, you know, digging, digging trenches to run their own fiber optic cables because that'll get them like five milliseconds less. Because again, that, in their world, that matters a lot. So, all right. Um, all right, so the way Spanner is going to do is it's going to break the database up into what they call tablets. These are just partitions. And they're going to use Paxos to do a leader election in the tablet group. But then if I have to update data across multiple tablets, uh, then I'll just use regular two-phase commit for this. So visually, it looks like this. You elect a leader uh, within my data center. All right, so, I, so 
you know, the, there's a tablet and there's replicated across different data centers. There's some data center that, that's a leader. All reads and writes have to go to, th to this guy, and then the US packs those to propagate them to everyone else. And then any snapshot reads, which again, like think of like a consistent snapshot on time, I can then run on the, the non-leader uh, uh, tablets to read any data that they have. But if I have a transaction that has to update another tablet group, whether, whether or not it's in my same data center or not, in their world they're replicating across multiple data centers, I'm going to use two-phase commit to then do updates that get propagated to those other tablets, which then go to their leader, who then propagates those changes using Paxos. So this is a good example where the things aren't mutually exclusive, like Paxos and two-phase commit. You can use a combination of, of, of both of them. Most systems just do one or the other. All right, I'm going to skip this slide. This basically says the, how they guarantee strict serializability and, and do timestamp ordering. So, all right, so there you go. You, three minutes to, to, to cover Paxos, or sorry, to cover uh, Spanner. Um, if you guys want to learn more about it, we can again, vote for it. We, we can cover it on, the, on, the, on the, the speed run at the end of the semester next week. All right, so uh, the main takeaway from all this, for this would be that maintaining consistent view of the database across multiple nodes is hard. Uh, and it's important you get this right because there will be failures. Not just the, the machine goes down, but like weird things that are outside of your control, the purview of the data system, like GC pauses or network hiccups. That again, so you have to prepare for all these things. And, and as I said, blockchains are a waste of time because most applications don't run in this world. Bitcoin is the only really useful thing you can use a blockchain for, right? Uh, most you know, it, most people running transactions are going to trust people. To, you know, or they're going to trust the machines, they're going to trust the authority, because this is sort of how the real world works. If you buy something, you give them your credit card number, you trust them to go charge your credit card number. All of those are going to be trusted transactions. Uh, and so you don't need blockchain. So the overhead of, of gaining Byzantine fault tolerance is unnecessary. So if this stuff is super interesting to you, there's a great blog article or blog uh, from this guy, Kyle Kingsbury. He has this thing called the Jepson Project. Ten years ago at Stripe, he basically wrote a torture chamber uh, for distributed databases to prove that they don't make all the, they don't achieve all the guarantees that they're claiming. They don't, you know, they're not strong and consistent. They can't handle this kind of failure. Like think in the context of the cat theorem. Like, you know, are they truly partition tolerant or so forth? Um, and so his blog articles are fascinating. They're very, very detailed and they go into all the failures that occur. Um, he was really just doing this as a hobby, but then now he spun it off as a consultancy company. So a bunch of the distributed database companies hire him to then run his torture chest, tor torture. Uh, chamber on their data databases, and, and and then he writes about all the failures. It was awesome. Is like he a bunch of companies claimed that they could do this, you know, this feature or that feature. He comes in and destroys them, and they have to change their marketing language to, to reflect that, like, oh yeah, we we are not actually this until they eventually actually fix it. So, again, if this stuff is uh, don't read <laughs> read his blog article. <laughs> You'll see why. Okay. <laughs> next week or sorry, next Wednesday, OLAP systems. We won't, we won't worry about transactions, but the big problem we're going to face now is how do we do joins in a distributed environment? Okay? I wouldn't normally say hit it, but he's not here because he's sick. <laughs> this shit is gangsta. <laughs> gangsta. <laughs> Bad boys are gangsta. <laughs> no, nothing but gangsta. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Now listen. I'm the poppy with the motherfucking hookup. 28 a gram, depending on if it's cook up. You ain't hit a mob yet, still got you shook up. I smack you with the bottom of the clip and tell you, look up. Show me where the safe's at before I blow your face back. I got a block on taps, the feds can't trace that. Style is like tamper proof, you can't lace that. The Dominican, or you could call me Dominican. Black skelly, black leather, black suede Timberlands. My all black 38 to send you to the pearly gates. You get consignment trying to skate, and that's your first mistake. I ain't lying. For that cake, your fam, I see you wake. My grams is heavyweight, then ran through every state. When they ask me how I'm living, I tell them I'm living great.